good to have you. Welcome. This is Thank the, you very much. That, you know how, how long the delay is between DC and Cote d'Ivoire. We could just hear it right there. Prime Minister, it's really wonderful to have you. We're going to talk about logistics. I know that you and Usman are good friends, so go ahead and greet each other. <laughs> I cannot greet, uh, you know, His Excellency your Prime Minister Patrick Ashi in English. I have to say in French. In French, s'il vous plaît. Bien sûr, bien sûr, je dois saluer vraiment Monsieur le Premier Ministre et dire combien je suis heureux uh, de, de, le, de, de le voir uh, et, et, et le remercier vraiment pour, uh, pour, pour sa présence. Féliciter l'équipe qui a pu mobiliser le Premier Ministre d'être là. Il a l'emploi de temps le plus chargé. Donc, uh, véritablement, et dire cette rencontre uh, me rappelle de très beaux souvenirs. Comme vous savez, j'étais un ancien country directeur de la Banque mondiale basée en Côte d'Ivoire et Monsieur le Premier ministre, à l'époque, était en charge des infrastructures économiques. On a fait des choses extraordinaires ensemble dans beaucoup de secteurs, en particulier dans le secteur des transports. And I'm sure that you will be impressed actually by what has been done in Côte d'Ivoire by Mr. Patrick Ashi, the Prime Minister of Côte d'Ivoire, uh, when he was in charge of uh, the infrastructure agenda uh, in Côte d'Ivoire. And for those who have visited Côte d'Ivoire before the crisis, during the crisis, after the crisis, I'm sure you have seen the transformation, uh, especially in infrastructure in Côte d'Ivoire. I think all this was, do was done under the leadership of uh, Prime Minister Patrick Hachi. So, Monsieur le Premier Ministre, it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yagana. It's the same pleasure for me to see you. And uh, as you know, that's right, uh, we had an IMF uh, mission going on here, we just finished, and uh, thank you very much to give me this opportunity. All right, so Prime Minister and Usman, just speak as if we're not here, so that we get real candid conversation. And uh, we have an online audience though, and we have an in-person audience in Washington, DC, who are gonna be really curious about how you talk about logistics and the food supply challenges that Côte d'Ivoire has and maybe where the World Bank is able to assist or where they could assist you further. So, Prime Minister, if we're talking about major risks to the food supply chain, how would you characterize that for Côte d'Ivoire? I think the, the first issue is to know that 60% of the arable land that is not used in the world is in the continent, yet the continent has a hard time to feed itself because there's a very big issue of production due to productivity. Not use of water, not use of uh, uh, specialized seeds, not use of fertilizer, not use of mechanization. So the productivity is a key issue. So we have small farms where the quantity is not that much. First problem, how do you transport? How do you get the product out of the field when you have been able to produce the amount that you, you, you've produced? Road maintenance is an issue. When you find a truck to transport that, the one who is ready to come all the way to the field, it costs you so much that you, you know your product itself, you know, uh, sale become an issue. Once you get the product and get the truck, then you have the issue of finding a market where you're going to sell it, because building you know markets. Uh, having supermarket is also another issue, which is distribution is an issue. Yet, uh, that's why very often we have a lot of post-harvest loss. So when you take all that in account, you see that that increased poverty. And we have to fight against that. This is really among the biggest issue that we have to face on the whole chain of logistics not only on the production side due to uh, a very uh, weak productivity, but also all along the line to be able to bring that product until, you know, uh, market. And, and when you see, as I say, 60% of arable land not used, it means that not only we can feed the whole continent, but beyond feed the world. So there are major issues there that have to be addressed. And the supply chain is certainly one of the biggest ones. 
Councilman, how do you address those major issues? How are you addressing those major issues? Well, first, I would like to say that this conversation is timely uh, because we know uh, how uh, the food uh, insecurity uh, is affecting uh, African uh, countries, and this situation has been compounded by uh, the uh, war in, uh, in, in Ukraine. And it's a kind of a paradox uh, because, as the Prime Minister has just mentioned, the potential in African countries is huge. We have land, we have water, uh, we have actually the workforce, and also the technology has evolved significantly uh, recently. But finding that African country is essentially dependent on the external world, uh, including uh, you know, a country whose population is very, very, very low compared to the gigantesque population in many African countries is, 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 is a, is, is a pro problematic. So this is uh, the first uh, point that we have to, to keep in mind. And obviously, uh, potentially, yes, uh, there, but the challenges also are, 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 are many. Um, you know, the cost of um, uh, trade uh, in Africa is extremely uh, high, and this Obviously, even if there is a surplus of food in the world to get them in African country and to make the price affordable in African context is uh, difficult because of the policies, because of uh, regulation, and of course, because also sometimes uh, barriers that are not necessarily uh, linked to the tariff, uh, uh, but linked to the, some other uh, uh, practice. And the second uh, or third, even if there is some increase in the production uh, in Africa, and we have seen indeed this recently in last year, for instance, when the raiding season was relatively good, the distance between the site where we produce and the consumption area is relatively uh, long and it's not uh, easy, especially in countries that are affected by crisis. So this is um, another element that we have uh, to, 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 to take into consideration. And uh, uh, finally, and I already alluded to that point, uh, the way actually the borders uh, are uh, functioning. You know, we know that the, the, uh, <coughs> the border in Africa and client country are uh, compared to other contexts in the world uh, are much trickier than, 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 than elsewhere. Uh, and we, it was interesting, in fact, when I was in Cote d'Ivoire a long time ago and the Prime Minister was the Minister of Infrastructure, uh, uh, interestingly, uh, <clears throat> Nicola was the practice manager for transport. Uh, uh, today is the global director for transport in the World Bank. And Ibu Juf, who is a practice manager for transport in my region, was a TTL. We had worked together on a regional project between Burkina Faso and Cote d'Ivoire and see how we can address some of those um, uh, elements related to policies, to regulation, to non-tariff barrier as a way really to help connect a country that uh, or area where they have more production and area where the, the demand of, uh, is, 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 is high. So this is just to say, from bank perspective, it's certainly very important that we approach this uh, issue from the angle in increasing resources to support some investment operation in the area of agriculture, but not to limit only to those. I think we need to use the power of our instrument in trying also to see how our budget support can really be a, a provide a, some, some, some solution uh, to this uh, tricky issue. So, Osman, are we still talking about what you could be doing or what you are doing? It's both, right? We are doing a lot. And in fact, uh, looking at how the uh, COVID has contributed to the dis disruption of the logistic chain and how the U Ukraine war has exacerbated the structural issue of food availability and affordability in Africa. Uh, the World Bank has put in place an envelope of $12 billion globally to support food uh, systems. 
and 50% of this envelope went to the bank, uh, to Africa. And we have using this through some specific program, national and, 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 and regional. Second, we have evolved, in fact, our instrument, uh, in, even in the transport sector, because the role of the corridor and the logistic in this agenda is fundamental. So we are putting more emphasis on, you know, supporting program that we have not supported enough in the past with the aim not only to address issues that exist, but in area where we have made progress to see how we can accelerate those uh, progress and also to amplify. Because I think on the medium to longer term, I'm convinced that Africa can be absolutely independent uh, regarding the food availability, and the bank has a very, very important role uh, to play in that. And since we have some good example, and probably we'll have the possibility to, to, to highlight some of those examples, it will be also important to not constantly try to reinvent the wheel. I think we need to find a way to expand those good examples that exist in Africa, but also to make sure that African country can learn from uh, some successful experience that we have uh, 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 elsewhere. I think this is extremely important for an institution like the World Bank, which is also known as being an institution that, you know, help country to be, to, 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 to have some mutual, uh, you know, opportunity to learn from each other to, for us also to generate knowledge and to make sure that the knowledge that has lead some productive results somewhere else can be replicated uh, or shared in some other uh, places in the world. Okay, so final question, Prime Minister Achi. You can ask Usman for anything you need in Cote d'Ivoire and Usman has to say yes. He cannot say maybe, he cannot say, I have to run that up the you chain, that chain. No, 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 this is like, this, obviously, <laughs> this is our fantasy world, but who knows what might get through. Prime Minister, ask for anything you need to help with that food supply chain challenge. What would that one thing be that you could ask and Usman could not refuse? Why, did, why didn't you tell me that before? <laughs> because then... <laughs> now we're talking. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, no, I think that uh, the World Bank is uh, already doing great, and I will size this opportunity to thank Diagana, who really uh, is deeply uh, involved and uh, on a daily basis on the projects going on. Uh, you know, he's been doing tre tremendously uh, since uh, he's been uh, uh, a vice president. And we thank him. First one, road maintenance. Since uh, they are already working on improving the productivity uh, on the field the production, being able to transport this production all the way through in the, na in the national market or international. So first of all, road maintenance is an issue. Second, you also have to be able to develop transport, you know, uh, uh, once the roads are good, then you need to develop transport system. Uh, and this is uh, the private sector, but also this is the public sector, uh, public-private sector of an ecosystem where we can access transport anytime we want it all along the year. We also have to think about financing, because uh, if you do not have an ecosystem that can allow the farmers and the small and medium-sized enterprise to access finance, then from the production all the way to transport logistics, you have a problem. Then if you move further down the line also, you have to think about transformation sometime very close to the site, because being able to save production uh, is not always easy. So you might have uh, uh, warehouses to build. You may have trans uh, uh, transformation, you know, small uh, factories uh, to transform locally the product so that you uh, reduce the post harvesting loss. But also you should be able to go all the way through to build market, to build a distribution system. 
And, and, and we're all talking about at the end of the day with the World Bank. And I think that this is the key world that we have to keep in mind, value chain. If you improve productivity and you increase it and you cannot transport it, then it's a loss. If you transport it at a cost that is too high, then people cannot afford it. This is an issue. So all the way, if you go and you cannot sell it at a price at the end of the day, you cannot access the client, then you haven't solved the problem, being locally or being internationally. So we are telling and we're working with the World Bank Group, being World Bank and IFC, all along the line, the state and the private sector, meaning the farmer, the transformer, so on and so forth, to be able to work for one all the way to the end. This is the solution. Just don't do a project that will solve one problem. See the whole value chain, the whole chain, and do a project that address every single key issue all along the line. So when I'm a producer, I know that any quantity I'm able to produce, once I'm well-trained, I have access to most of the key issue we're talking about, like irrigation, fertilizer, specialized seed mechanization, then I can get all that all across to my client at a price that will help me have a decent life. This is what you know it is about. And I think this is what we've been doing with the World Bank. And I think we're getting very good results on that. Prime Minister Patrick Achi, uh, Usman was making mental notes, not physical notes, but mental notes on what you really need to do and work with the World Bank on. We thank you so much for being part of Transforming Transportation 2023. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Usman. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. De rien. Thank, thank, thank you, Usman. Thank you. Don't fall off the stage because I will be in trouble. No, 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 That's the kind of logistics I cannot fix. All right. Okay. Plenary panelists number two, please come on stage. The audience will make you feel so welcome. They will cheer even as you walk onto the stage. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> You go this way. Don't fall off. Be very careful. Do you see your name tags? There we go. Fantastic. And I'm not going to have anyone sit right at the end so that we don't have a gap here. So, yeah, no, no. Oh, where are we? All right, here we go. Fantastic. Welcome, everybody. We are trying to, in this plenary, and untangle the global supply chain. So is it possible to have green and resilient logistics is what we're talking about. I want to say hello to our panellists. Nice to see you. Really welcome to have you. Um, OK, uh, starting at the end. Christoph, hello. What does it say on your business card, Christoph? It's on. I wouldn't trick on? you. OK, great. Yes, yeah, go ahead. So um, I'm the CEO of the Smart Freight Center. Uh -huh. uh, the Smart Freight Center has a, a unique spot in the world. It's a global platform that is focused on decarbonization of freight. And we have developed, like 10 years ago, the so-called uh, Global Logistics Emissions Council standard, which has just been uh, converted into the ISO standard. So we deliver, deliver the tools uh, across all modes, end-to-end, -end, so in, in C, air and land to measure emissions and then have uh, brought together the ecosystem of global shippers, LSPs and carriers to reduce emissions. Christoph, well, me. so good to have you on this plenary. Uh, don't turn the microphone off, just leave it on while it's on the stage. Thank you. Catherine Palmer, welcome to plenary number two. Tell our audience who you are, what you do. Hello, and um, thanks for the invitation to join this um, plenary today. So my name is Catherine Palmer. I am the maritime lead at the Climate Champions team um, that supports the UN high-level climate champions for COP27 and COP28. So um, what it is that we do as the, the Climate Champions team is um, we bring the voice of non-state actors 
um, to the parties um, that are, are working to achieve the Paris Agreement. So we're really here to be able to, um, to look at the, the system transformation that is needed for the maritime system, work with um, raising ambition, accelerating action, practical um, action being taken on the ground locally um, and regionally, as well as action that is being taken globally, and bring that progressive action to um, the parties to be able to show that you know more stringent policy and ambition can be raised in policy so we can can have this this ambition loop between non-state actors and, and policy makers and that's what it is that we do good to have you mark levinson welcome to plenary number two thank you i'm an historian and an economist i live here in washington dc and I write about things like logistics and container shipping and globalization. And certainly the concern about sustainability has had a considerable impact on these areas. And I'm delighted to be invited here to participate in this panel. Good to have you, Mark. Tell us about your best-selling book, The Box. I love the title of it. It's short, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. No, there's more, though. There's like a sub part of that title, which I think would be good. Yes, how the, the shipping container made the world smaller and the world economy bigger. And uh, I've argued that the uh, development of container shipping led to a substantial decline in transportation costs and much greater reliability. And this basically made possible the sort of globalization that we know today. Thanks, Mark. Young Tae Kim. It's always nice to chat to you. Please tell our audience who you are for the few who do not know what you do. Uh, I'm the Secretary General of the International Transport Forum. I, I've been at this position since 2017. And ITF is an intergovernmental body with 64 member countries. And we act like a platform, global platform, and also publishing uh, between 30 and uh, 60 uh, reports every year. So uh, on an institutional level, I'm very happy to announce that ATF has a really good and excellent relation, cooperation relationship with World Bank. Catherine, I couldn't but my eyes, my ears pricked up when you said COP27 and COP28, because the climate crisis, the climate emergency is something that is really, we're focusing on. Every, every area has to focus on it, really. Um, there's something that you said that I know is really important that you wanted to get over, and that was about emissions, cutting carbon emissions, and what we haven't talked about yet in this conference that you feel is incredibly important. Get us started. Um, so I think um, what we're, we're talking about here today is decarbonizing the transport system. And one of those modes of transport is maritime, ocean freight, um, and, and shipping and I think that um, we have to recognize that we can't decarbonize transport if we don't include shipping and we can't keep within the 1.5 temperature goals if we don't include decarbonizing transport and specifically decarbonizing um, shipping. So I think that's that's one of the main messages I would like to get across is that we do um, need to include shipping um, as a mode of transport in in these discussions. And, and also the fact that by decarbonizing the maritime system, you know, there are lots of co-benefits to that as well. You know, so there's so, um, we, we've heard just earlier on about the challenges around global supply chains. And, um, and so if we want to have resilient supply chains going forward, then, then you know, a decarbonized maritime system is one that is climate smart, resilient and equitable. And so there are many co-benefits around resilience and um, equity that decarbonizing shipping um, brings to um, the countries. Mm. So in the earlier conversation, we were talking about cars and what car emissions are doing in terms of contributing um, to uh, not having a sustainable method of transport. But what about shipping? What is shipping doing where you say, oh, we could decarbonize that? Because I think I would suggest, apart from our experts up here, that a lot of people aren't thinking about freight. I think COVID helped us to think about freight. And I think um, what's currently happening between Ukraine and, and Russia right now is helping us think about freight, because we had a bit of a shock. 
about what happens to our food supply. But other than that, I'm not sure enough of us really think about freight. I think that's a, a really valid point. And, and I guess, you know, how our goods get to our doorstep was, was maybe not something that was at the forefront of everyone's mind. And, and COVID certainly brought that, um, that, you know, shipping became much more visible. And, and also the fact that, you know, so 90% of, of global trade is by ships, you know, shipping is, is the backbone of supply chains. It, it supports over 2 million seafarers um, at work. And, and so when you think about um, not only the restrictions of getting um, goods and, and keeping supply chains moving, but also the challenges that the workers experienced, you know, when countries shut their, their borders. So... Um, but I think, what is shipping actually doing? Well, um, when we look at the momentum and, and movement behind um, the recognition to decarbonise shipping, that has grown significantly and, and uh, over the last few years. So I think that end goal, um, there's, there's much more convergence around that end goal. There's also of, of zero by, by 2050 at least, and there's also a lot of convergence around near-term goals that by 2030 we need to have at least 5% of zero emission fuels and the international shipping's um, fuel demand. And that convergence is, is therefore enabling um, kind of first mover projects to, to come together. And these, are, are, these first mover projects are consortiums across the full value chain, which is what the, the Prime Minister was talking about, is we need this to work from a full value chain perspective. So it's about the energy supplier, it's about the customer of the end goods that are being shipped, it's bringing in, it's the ship owner who is doing the transport, it's hearing the voices of the workforce within this dialogue, and, and it's putting together these first mover consortiums, which um, uh, we call um, green shipping corridors and the momentum behind that and the movement that is happening and these are public private um, consortiums so and they're looking at at how do we decarbonize those routes those trade routes so we decarbonize them um, they you know we we make them resilient and, and we include um, the aspects of enabling a, a just transition within these so, first movements. So, Catherine, programs. you say we decarbonise them, we make them resilient, but you're not telling us how. So, <laughs> Like, it's magic. It's like, you are now decarbonised. Right. You are now resilient. So, so what, how, how, how does that happen? So a lot of that how is very much um, what are the zero emission fuels that are going to be used on board the ship. So mm -hmm. we've got to look at it from a um, technical feasibility, economic viability, um, safety, reliability. Um, so, so it's... And, and we're starting to see much more. And, and we see the customers of shipping have signalled their demand for zero emission ocean freight. So many of the large retail brands have now come together um, forming um, buyers alliances for zero emission freight, um, signaling that they want um, that demand. We've got suppliers of green hydrogen uh, or green ammonia sort of coming forward and saying we can produce X amount to go into the shipping sector. So all these little bits along the sure. value chain, everyone's making commitment, everyone's doing projects, okay. um, and they just need to... They will come together. Christoph, pick up your microphone. Yes. Thank Great. you. Go ahead. What's on your mind? Uh, well, I, th I think I can, um, on, on, the, on the maritime side, um, indeed, and, and this is also true for, for, for road freight and air, and air freight. A few years ago, we, we said these are the hard to abate sectors. Yeah? So these are, I mean, you can first do uh, power and then you can do maybe passenger cars, but when it comes to us here, uh, we are the hard to abate, we come last. Yeah? But this, has, this conversation has changed significantly. And in all these sectors, there is now ecosystem-based coalitions end-to-end, -end, et cetera, that are working on fuel choices, that are working on standards, that are working on getting finance into that because they all have the, this scaling finance challenge, et cetera. So this is great. And, and uh, as a smart freight um, center, so we are in a way 
some one of the glues of the whole thing. Yeah. So because uh, I think you we talked about data. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you need to measure uh, what you want to achieve. Yeah. And uh, so um, we, for example, we prefer we 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 do data sharing platforms actually between shippers and carriers, yeah? So shippers that own the cargo and carriers that actually move the cargo, yeah? And, um, and the, the thing is that that is not trivial, yeah? So because you need standards on how to exchange those data, so we have, have these, these uh, ISO standard, GLAC standard, et cetera, and you need the trust to do it, yeah? Because uh, if, if there's no trust, there's no exchange of data, and you have to make it productive. And I think this is also, there's a lot more technology, so in, pr in principle, data are, are there and everywhere, but now the key is to, you have to enable shippers to make the right environmental choices, yeah, for their, basically for their carriers and, and drive basically what, what, what Catherine was talking about. Enable shippers to make the right environmental choices. Is that a carrot or a stick? Well, it, it, first of all, it's, um, it's kind of both. It's a commitment. I mean, many of the shippers are committed to science-based targets and they have built roadmaps uh, in order to achieve those. Yeah? And there's, you know, um, and they, they, um, they, they report those emissions actually on global platforms. Um, now, um, in order to, to show the right acceleration, the right pace for that, I mean, you also need to, to do sticks. And this is where kind of the policy angle comes in. I think without a policy angle, uh, there's no level playing field, yeah? And, and you need level playing fields because otherwise you say, uh, okay, me as a first mover, I may be disadvantaged because I have higher costs. Who is going to pay for that? And there's a green premium involved and you need to f find ways to allocate the green premium in an efficient way across the value chain. Secretary General, you have made about eight notes. Read out the last three. I, th I think uh, passing through this difficult period, uh, we, we can agree that now we have uh, a different perception on, on many things. Perhaps we, we thought this was so natural and so normal, so comfortable, but now we, can even, we cannot say that you, you have to uh, use transport public more than before because we know that during the pandemic there was a virus issue and uh, also even some, some countries encouraged people to use private car more than public transport to, to avoid dissemination of the virus. And also about the, uh, the holistic approaches. During the peaceful period, we didn't really pay attention to resilience systems. And, uh, Platforms like this, and we, we talked about so many things, but we didn't really deal with uh, crisis in a more uh, effective way. But now, perhaps it's time to think that we might have to uh, rethink everything that we treated in the before uh, with a new uh, a, a holistic uh, viewpoint. So, for example, talking about maritime uh, decarbonization, it's a bit uh, very narrow uh, topic from the, uh, the general perspective of the mobility. When we deal with the different modes of transport, we have to talk about road sector and also aviation sector and maritime sector as well. But uh, we can talk about direct measures that can really facilitate decarbonization of the maritime sector. But if we have a holistic view, there can be other alternatives. So we can develop road sector corridor and also railway sector corridor, perhaps distributing uh, the task to different modes. We can perhaps uh, reduce the burden of maritime uh, sector because nowadays we know that 90% of the transportation of freight is done on sea. It's done on sea. And then uh, perhaps we can develop more eco-friendly corridors on the Eurasian continent, for example. We can allocate some of the burdens uh, from the maritime sectors. So I think uh, now it's time to transform our the ambition to action in more concrete ways. Can I ask you the same thing that I asked Catherine? Because you're throwing out phrases like, yeah, yeah, of course, an eco-friendly corridor. What does that mean from your perspective? No, that, that's not really different from what everyone thinks today. And basically, uh, there should be a less uh, CO2 emissions and less pollutions, and perhaps in a more efficient ways. But why we are uh, dependent so much on the existing corridors so far? And basically, it's, it's a natural evolution, considering the uh, geopolitical, also socioeconomic uh, the factors. But uh, now, now we see uh, suddenly 
we are facing uh, unexpected events that we never expected, but uh, perhaps we have to think about plan B and plan C in case we have something uh, serious in the future. Um, let me go to Mark before I go to the rest of, the, um, of, of our panel. Mark, um, there's a but I know that you are thinking at the moment, and that but is about greener shipping and the impact of greener shipping. Sure. Can you share that with us, please? Yes, uh, I'd, I'd like to make a, a couple of, of points here. One is that people talk in general about the maritime industry, which is actually a very, very complicated industry with a lot of different parts. Uh, we tend to think about the container shipping industry because it's more visible. And I think there's a lot of interest in decarbonization in the container shipping industry because they deal with consumer products companies extensively. If you were to talk to people whose business is, say, transporting iron ore or running oil tanker ships, you'd find that they're a lot less interested in decarbonization. So I think it's important to have a, a view of the complexity of the industry. Second, and, and this is, I think, not going to be popular in this audience, perhaps, but decarbonizing shipping is going to be expensive. The estimates that I've heard, and I'm certainly not a technical expert in this, uh, are that the cost of moving a container, a kilometer, using zero emission fuels is going to be somewhere between two times and six times the cost today. In addition to that, the vessels are going to be moving slower because the greater cost of fuels will be partially alleviated by uh, slowing down. So this means that maritime transport is going to become more expensive. That's certainly going to affect uh, us as consumers. It's also going to have significant effects in countries that, for example, import a lot of uh, food by sea. Okay, they may face higher transport costs. That may have some consequences for consumers in poor countries. And I would uh, point here uh, to Young Tae's comments just a moment ago about it's the importance of looking across the chain because it may be possible to make up for these, some of these higher ocean transport costs by doing things that reduce the cost of moving the goods at the port or inland once they've arrived at the port. Christoph, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, when, when, you, when, when I stay on maritime for a moment, so, so there's basically, technically speaking, two pathways on the fuel side, so uh, which are zero carbon or re renewable. So it's the, the e-methanol pathway and the e-ammonia pathway. Um, the, the two to six times, I think, is actually on the high side. I mean, uh, to be honest, I, I'm more, it's plus like, uh, plus 30 to 40 percent, yeah, so, so and, and the, the interesting, the interesting calculation is always if you think about um, your container ship with all these boxes on there, how much uh, moving to zero emission fuels would actually mean in terms of um, uh, buying a pair of sneakers in a shop. That's maybe one percent or two percent more. Yeah. So it's. I think it's high cost on the on the level for the for the ship owner that actually needs to retrofit for ammonia, for example, uh, his uh, the, the ship. Yeah. So this is actually specific for maritime. It's different in aviation. In maritime, they need to retrofit. So there's a cost to that. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a green premium to that. But if that green premium can be efficiently allocated, yeah, um, to the uh, value chain, and there are. Uh, the, the big shippers, the IKEA, the Amazons, and all of them that want to decarbonize their scope three emissions. So they maybe are willing uh, to take part of that green premium and go to the shops and say, we have a product here which is green, and, and you, consumer, the 3% is nobody actually going to notice even. Yeah? So, so I think there's a relatively efficient way to deal with that, yeah? with those higher costs if you have the right system approach. Mark. Yeah, I, higher transportation costs uh, are likely to result in some things uh, not being shipped. And higher inventory costs may end up having a significant effect. I think inventories may be the most boring subject under the sun. Uh, an inventory is something that somebody 
has purchased and can't get access to, like goods that are stuck on a ship, okay, or sitting in a warehouse. Uh, inventory costs have been close to zero for the past 10 years because interest rates were so low. Inventory costs are not zero anymore. It costs a lot of money if your goods are going to take an extra week or an extra two weeks to make a trip from Asia to Europe. And these are considerations on the margin for a manufacturer or a retailer. These are the sorts of considerations that people take into account when they're deciding where things should be made and how they should be transported. Uh, are they going to lead to uh, massive closures of factories? Probably not. But they are going to lead to decisions on the margin about uh, moving where things are produced and restructuring supply chains. Secretary General, a lot of what we're talking about can be addressed by collaboration, cooperation on different platforms. I know that's something that you care deeply about. Can you share with us, because some of these are quite difficult challenges. If you become greener in shipping and freight, who pays the cost of that? How do you address that by collaboration? I think it, that's a really important and essential question for us because we, we transport experts and stakeholders normally focus on transport side. And when we talk about decarbonizing transport, it's a decarbonizing transport sector. But uh, knowing that decarbonizing transport is just a part of the decarbonizing our society. And then we have to identify what roles that we can play. And to do so, basically, without working together with non-transport sectors, we, we cannot achieve a lot. So we can be ambitious, but uh, to be realistic and to be honest, we should find something uh, concrete. And, and to do so, basically, uh, when we talk about supply chain, it doesn't really mean that corridor questions and construction of infrastructures. How can you facilitate border crossing issues? And how can we support landlocked countries who have no sea transportation? And then uh, everything is interconnected. So we have to involve customs organization. We have to involve environment organization with no transport, no trade, with no transport, no tourism. So basically, we, 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 we should be uh, open-minded to, to bring them on board. Are these some of the questions that the ITF is addressing right now? Can you give us an example? Yeah, recently we, uh, we are really working close, closely with uh, so many uh, international partners like World Bank and also we, we work together with U United Nations agencies. And for example, uh, when I visited Geneva a few weeks ago to participate in the UNEC meeting, Inland Transport Committee, mainly it's focusing on road sectors, but at the time, taking that opportunity, I, I tried to meet with the even WHO and also ILO, because labor sector is also very important on, on a sea side, on a road side. And also we, we met uh, UNCTAD, the trade agencies, and we all agree that we have to work more closely to cope with this difficult period. And uh, basically, crisis can be transformed into opportunity. So with a little bit of optimism, we, we can go even further. I've heard that a lot over the last few years. Don't waste the crisis, turn it into an opportunity. What opportunities have, been t been, have you seen being utilized? I think opportunity meaning that now we are becoming more open-minded, uh, knowing that uh, we have to rethink and reboot and perhaps redefine mm. the way we worked in the past. And everything was so natural that we didn't really try to have a resilience and backup system in our daily life. And perhaps in, in transport sector, now we, we know the importance of the health issues importance of the other issues, digital, and even women. And basically, that's why all the questions in mobility sector are becoming more and more complicated. And without really having our friends group who support transport discussions, we can really make uh, relevant solutions. Mark, go ahead. You're smiling. I'm thinking about what's the most ambitious area of logistics or freight or shipping or aviation that you're seeing is both green and resilient going into that area because that's one of the things we're looking at untangling our global supply chains is it possible to be green and resilient regarding logistics what is the best example you can give us of this is where it's working this is a good model 
We're seeing a couple of uh, trends going on in logistics, and I don't think they're secret to, to people here. In fact, these trends were underway before the pandemic. Um, for those who don't know, uh, international trade as a share of the world economy peaked in 2008. So already that form of globalization was, was slowing. We've seen companies establish what I'd call redundant production. Okay, there's a lot of talk about uh, bringing manufacturing back, whatever that means. That's not happening so much. What we're seeing, though, is companies that used to make something in one place and serve the whole world market are now looking to do it in two or three different places. So they've got some resilience, and in the process of that, they can have more modern facilities and, and uh, close some of their um, older plants if needed. Uh, we're seeing similarly that uh, the days when a ship line or a port would compete for all of a customer's business are gone because that's not resilient. It, it used to be you'd, you'd see the guys from the, the ports and, and they'd go to talk to manufacturers and retailers and say, why don't you send all of your stuff through Folkestone or, or uh, um, Felixstowe or, or Long Beach or wherever. That doesn't happen anymore either because nobody wants to be stuck with a single port or a single ship line or a single point of failure. And so we've seen a, a lot of restructuring. And I think the general tendency of this is going to be to bring a lot of production, not necessarily home, but closer to consumers. And that is probably good in the long run in terms of the uh, emissions from mm. uh, freight transportation. Um, Catherine, are you seeing an area where you think, oh, I really want to share this with our audience here online and in the room where you think that that's the gold standard, that's working, that's green, that's resilient, that's shipping. Are we still in wishful thinking land? I, I'm not sure where we are right now. I think we're moving um, more rapidly than we've ever moved before. Mm. Um, but I think, um, I mean, um, Christoph sort of touched on it by saying, um, that, you know, it, in order to... We've got pockets of niche innovation kind of happening around the world, um, whether the, that be, um, you know, there might be some, some domestic shipping, some short-sea um, shipping, some, some service vessels that are able to have fuel that is... Uh, zero-emission fuel that is produced locally and therefore used locally. Um, and these kind of niche innovations... Um, are demonstrating that this can be done safely. Um, but what we now need to do is we really need to scale and accelerate these niche innovations that are happening around the world. And, and how do we do that? And I think, you know, one of the key levers for that scaling and that acceleration is going to be global policy. And, you know, we are at a critical stage in um, greenhouse gas negotiations for the maritime sector um, through the International Maritime Organization, um, which is the UN specialized agency for, for maritime. And, and I think it's, it's being able to have that policy signal um, set in that, um, that trajectory um, with those significant, ambitious targets for 2030, 2040, and not just setting the long term, but being able to bring that near term, because it's those near term targets that are going to unlock further action by, for the private sector. Mm. Um, and so I think that's, you know, we're at that critical stage and that's where we are. And that's what 2023 is really going to be about um, for the maritime sector. Yeah, so uh, scaling impact is key. Yeah? So, I mean, we, yes, we are moving, but we don't have time. Uh, so, a net zero 2050 is a, tar is a good target, but now it's a decade of implementation. And um, let, me, let me switch foot to another sector for a moment. Yeah? So, the, um, sustainable fuel, yeah? sustainable aviation fuel, aviation sector. Um, uh, also hard to bait sector. Um, the, there are um, 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 alternatives to jet A1 fuel. They are two to six times more expensive. Um, if, you, if you would take them today, it would actually raise passenger prices. 
Um, the ICAO has done a long-term inspirational goal last year in October. That was actually a major achievement, but now this needs to be converted into policy on both sides of the Atlantic. So we have the, the uh, Green Deal in the EU with a, with a blending mandate, and uh, we have the IRA in, in North America and others that are actually looking at how this deployment scale up will now happen over, over the next couple of, of years. There's a lot of uh, um, a role for the private sector so this uh, by voluntary action. So again, the, the shippers or, or those actually folks who fly a lot, they're basically saying, well, we wanna, de we wanna decarbonize our supply chain. Yeah? So we will take the green premium again. Yeah? So it's about taking the green premium at a, at, a, at a market formation point of time when we are scaling. So I think the real conversation that we have in all three sectors, road freight, sea freight, and air freight at the same time, is how, to, how do we get to the inflection point? Yeah? So targets are there. Um, there is more commitment, uh, not every, and now we need to scale, and we need to scale it also with equity uh, uh, positions, uh, equity concerns, because, for example, in, sus in sustainable aviation fuel, we are having a regulation in the, in the EU and in, in, in Europe, but we don't have that in, in emerging market countries, yeah? And there's no mechanism so far to bring actually sustainable aviation fuel to those countries who actually may need it the most because the tourists that are coming there would otherwise be, uh, be, be um, actually making the climate, uh, the emissions higher, yeah? So we need to kind of have equity concerns along the scaling at the same time. I am opening up this conversation, so the microphone, you know where it is if you're already in the room, so do stand by there if you've got a question. We're going to start online. Rico, how is our online audience reacting to this conversation? Comments and questions, please. Yes, thank you, Femi. So we have a lot of participants dialing in from elsewhere. We have people from Brazil, France, all the way to Pakistan, and a lot of participants have actually experienced supply chain shocks. Uh, in the past two years, have even suffered from food shortages and are looking at the opportunities of the transformation you've all alluded to. And one question which um, summarizes and goes along the lines of, of questions in several forms, which we've seen in the chat, is resilient logistics appear to be a very technical and global discussion. And we seem to have all the tools and the knowledge in place. However, how can citizens participate in creating green and resilient supply chains to make this transformation inclusive and foster economic growth in those countries which previously did not participate, such as in oil and gas and a fossil-based world? Mark, is there space for citizens' activism in shipping and aviation freight? Well, there is because these companies are quite sensitive to public opinion. Okay, and this goes to what I alluded to earlier when uh, I mentioned that uh, the shippers, the ship lines that deal with carrying iron ore and, and oil are not as concerned. The ship lines that deal with consumer products companies are very concerned. Uh, airlines deal heavily with passengers. They're very concerned about public opinion. Uh, they don't want to be the bad people. I saw a, a commercial on television last night here in the United States sponsored by an airline talking about how it was using renewable fuels and is going to be green. So I think that there's uh, a lot of opportunity here and, and consumer voice is very important in pushing companies down this path. Crystal's eyebrows, when he heard about the advert, went like this, like an extra 10, 10 inches up off the top of his forehead. Why did you raise your eyebrows about that? Is, no. that, is that greenwashing by an airline? <sighs> No, I think the, there are standards what what, what uh, sustainable fuels are. So there's actually a, a clear understanding what it is. So IKEA puts standards, Europe puts standards. It's more about uh, MRV, about uh, basic compliance to that. But I think the, the great thing is what, what Mark was talking about is this, for example, these sustainable aviation fuels have become a household topic. It's a dinner topic in families, yeah? So, our sons basically said a few years ago, fly, you remember flight shaming, yeah? And the airline industry got pretty scared about it, yeah? So they, we, we don't want to fly for vacation anywhere. We want to go, you know, uh, without flying, yeah? because flying is bad for the climate, yeah? So it probably was a bit unfair and out of proportion, but, but it became a household thing and, and uh, to, uh, catering to consumers. And now you see in every airport, yeah? Fly responsibly, fly sustainably, People go on headline TV and, 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 and uh, 
this has so this has changed. I think it's not so much in shipping yet. Yeah, so it hasn't become a household yet. But in in aviation, it's a big it's a big topic. I think um, well, one of the other things I would add from where citizens get involved is very much about um, port communities. You know, people live in cities. Um, coastal cities. These coastal cities have big ports. People living close by, and and you know, so so we see a lot of um, citizen involvement around um, air quality uh, and pollution um, coming from from ships in the ports. So I think um, you know, I think it, it, there's you know, civil society and citizens have a role to play in this transformation and, and I would just encourage, you know, that they are a, a key lever in the, the transformation that is, is needed. Mm -hmm. Next question, thank you. Jason, Meg. Check, check. Keep talking, the microphone will come on. Check, check. Uh, Jason Meggs for the world again, thank you so much. Um, quick question about the box. Uh, as we look to the incredible potential for lightweight electric vehicles to perform local trips substituting for cars, trucks, and vans, uh, none of which carry shipping containers, there may be an increased need for standardization for smaller local parcels um, and to, to go from shipping containers to local delivery. Any innovation there? What do you think, the box, for anyone? Mark. I'm not sure it's mine. Uh, the, uh, in, in terms of standardization of parcels, I've actually heard of this discussion, but this is a discussion that's being led in individual companies for their own business, that they're going to be able to operate everything if they use the same box inside the big box. Uh, I don't think that there's any broader movement to, to standardization here, and frankly, it's going to be very difficult to do that. Okay, thank you for the final question for Plenary 2. Young Tay, Mark, Catherine and Christoph, thank you very much for sharing your expertise. We applaud you and appreciate you.